See, that's how you know you and your wife are one when the pastor calls you Bahar. Abraham Bahar, A Bahar, praise God. How many of you guys are happy to be in the house of the Lord? Amen? Amen, amen. Well, it is a joy, it is a joy to be with you today to be able to share God's word. Let me tell you, this past week, I just went back to the gym for the first time since the pandemic started. And I'm just going to keep it transparent because we're in the 11 o'clock service. I was on the struggle bus. I was huffing and puffing. But let me tell you, that trainer said something really interesting. The trainer said, you're going to leave this place better than when you came. Because you are being pushed and you're being challenged. Beloved, my prayer for our time today and for this space and this place is that we would leave this place better than when we came. Because we are lifting up the name of King Jesus, the King of glory. And whenever the name of Jesus is exalted, his people are encouraged. Amen? Amen. Well, it is a joy to be here. Um, again, you already heard the name of Bahar. My lovely wife, my queen is here with me. We got a beautiful amen. Amen. Clap it up. We got a beautiful four-year-old daughter as well. And I said this in the first service. She's the little queen. Because I had the audacity to call her princess one day. And she checked me, and she said, I'm the little queen. I'm the little mommy. So I'm praying that she's being a good girl to mama, mama and papa, to grandma and grandpa right now. Amen. Well, let's get right, right to it. Amen. We're going to be continuing where we left off. And in this day, we're going to be looking at James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. And this is what the word of God said. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, that part is key. Do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, is unspiritual and demonic. For where je jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from abo above is first pure, then peaceable gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. This is God's word. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask his Holy Spirit to breathe on this word today. Amen. So, Father God, we just thank you, Lord, and we approach the throne of grace, welcoming the presence of your Holy Spirit into this place that the name of the King of glory would be exalted above all things, Father. We don't just want to be knowers and hearers of the word. We also want to be doers of the word, Father God. So let us leave this place better than when we came. I pray that you would give us eyes to see, that you would give us ears to hear, that you would open up our hearts and that our hearts would be fertile ground to be able to receive the word like seed, mix it with faith, and be fruitful in every area of our life. We ask this and we depend on you in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Well, how many of you guys have enjoyed this series on James? I tell you, James is no joke. Amen. James is brutally honest. He does not care who you are. He's going to give you that truth. So the Bible, for example, says that we have three enemies. The devil, the flesh, and the world. Now let me tell you, I, speaking about myself... I got four enemies, the devil, the flesh, the world. And can you please put that picture up? Look at my fourth enemy, the bathroom scale. The bathroom scale. Like I'm about to rebuke that scale spirit right now in Jesus' name. Get behind me, scale. Now, the bathroom scale and I, we don't have the best relationship. We're not that close. We're not that close. Right? Well, we're not cool. In fact, I try to avoid the bathroom scale. So whenever I start enlarging my territory and the clothes start fitting a little tighter, a little bit more snug, my default setting is to buy bigger clothes. Now, buying bigger clothes is going to help me feel comfortable, but it's not going to challenge me to change anything. But when I step on that bathroom scale, Lord God, I know exactly where I am. See, the bathroom scale does not care about my feelings. The bathroom scale doesn't really care about my self-esteem either. I step on that bathroom scale and the scale's like, mmm. Mmm. <laughs> mm. 
It's just like, bro, look, here are the numbers. Here are the numbers. The numbers don't lie. Here you go, Papa. Now get off me. Right? The scale's like, get off me. Reading the book of James is like sitting or standing on a bathroom scale because it's going to give us truth that we may or may not be ready to receive. That truth is not going to help us stay comfortable. It's actually going to challenge us to change some things. Because James is very direct. He doesn't really beat around the bush. He, like the bathroom scale, also does not really care about our feelings. He doesn't really care about our self-esteem. He was a straight shooter. So, for example, one of the things that James says is this. Do not give preferential treatment based on somebody's outward appearance. When we look at James chapter 2, he talks about favoritism, and he gives us this interesting scenario, James does. He says, let's say you got two people that come to church for the first time. One of them comes in a nice suit, suited and booted. You got some jewelry on, looking right, looking very organized, very orderly. He looks like he has it all together. That person looks like he's going places. Then you got another person, they look completely opposite. They're coming in looking raggedy. And shaggy. And in the eyes of the world, they, didn't, they don't look like they have a lot of value or a lot of importance. James says this, don't you dare give preferential treatment to the person with the nice clothes. That is sinful. Now, if James was speaking in our context in 2021, he would probably say this, Christians, your walk with Jesus is not just about speaking truth to power. It's not just about influencing the influencer. It's also about rubbing shoulders with the marginalized, rubbing shoulders with the oppressed, with people that feel invisible, people that feel forgotten, the vulnerable. People that don't have a high status in the eyes of the world, they should have a high status in the church because we believe that all people are made in the image and likeness of God. Amen? So whether you came today all suited and booted with a nice nice suit or a dress, or whether you're wearing some boots and a hoodie, or whether you're wearing sweatpants. Maybe some of you online are wearing sweatpants, and that's okay. But listen, welcome to the house of the Lord. Welcome home. Whether you smell like expensive cologne and expensive perfume, or whether, listen, whether you smell like weed and alcohol, welcome to the house of the Lord. How many of us know that the the church is not a spiritual social club? It's not a spiritual country club filled with religious elites that criticize the world and talk about how awesome they are. The church is a hospital, a hospital for the hurting, for the downtrodden, for those that have realized that all the pleasures and the things of this world have an expiration date. And what we do when we get together is we make much, we worship the great physician who is Jesus. So however you came today in whatever state you're watching us online, our desire for you is that you would get with the great physician, Jesus. Because James teaches us something really key. You could look really good on the outside. You could look really impressive. And you could be rotten to the core. And on the flip side of that, you could also look really unimpressive in the eyes of the world, but you could be a diamond in the rough in the hands of Jesus. So what James says is what Jesus says and what we see in 1 Samuel. Men, the world, people look at the outside, but God, he looks, he searches, he sees the inside. And this is just one example of what James says. Now, another thing that James says is this theme that we've been looking at for almost a month now. And it's that faith, real, true, living, activated faith, is a faith that works. Why don't you tell your neighbor, my faith works. So in week one, we saw James chapter one. And we saw that faith works in the wilderness, in the wilderness of trials and pressures. Because it's in the middle of those moments that we cling to the Lord and we don't no longer lean on our own understanding. As Pastor Javier just said, in our weakness, we cling to him. In week two, we saw James chapter two. And we see that faith works through our works. James says that there's a connection between our creed and our deeds. 
between what we believe with our heads and what we do with our hearts. And then last week, we saw the beginning of James chapter 3, and we see that faith works through our words, through our tongue. And we learned that we should be speaking words of life to other people. Our words should build people up and not tear them down. So up to now, beloved, we've seen that faith works in the wilderness and what we go through, through our works, what we do, and through our words, what we say. Today, we're going to be looking at this. Faith works through wisdom. Faith works through wisdom. And we're going to answer three questions about the wisdom of God. What is it? Why do we need it? And how do we practically walk in it? And the title to this sermon, beloved, is Root Before Fruit. Root Before Fruit. So what is godly wisdom? In verses 14 through 18 of James chapter 3, we see this contrast of two types of wisdom. There's earthly wisdom and then there's godly wisdom. James uses these words to describe earthly wisdom. Bitter jealousy, selfish ambition, and falsehood. These things, James says, leads to disorder and every vile thing. Now, when talking about the wisdom of God, James uses these words, pure, peace, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy, full of good fruits, impartial, sincere. These things, he said, lead to peace. So godly wisdom, beloved, means having a Christ-like mindset. It means having the mind of Christ And it's characterized by sincerity, by selflessness, self-sacrifice, humility, and holiness. Somebody who abides in the wisdom of God is somebody that abides in peace. In vertical peace with God and horizontal peace with others. How many of you could use some godly wisdom right about now? Amen? We just look at the state of the world. You look at the state of the nation. You look at our community. We need some godly wisdom. All of us make thousands of decisions each and every day. We need some godly wisdom. Now, I want you to listen to the words of of Bede. Who was Bede? Bede was not a rapper or a Marvel superhero, Pastor Javier. Bede was a theologian from the 600s, and he says this. He said, the heart is like a root and contains within itself all the fruit of the action which proceeds from it. Someone who operates from a spirit of jealousy and strife will do nothing which is not tainted with evil, however good it may appear to others. All right, so so Bede, which is an awesome name, Bede and James, they teach us something incredible about wisdom, belief, and behavior. And Pastor Javier teed it up perfectly last week. It was like an alley-oop. And what they're teaching us is this. There is a connection between fruit and root. The fruit of earthly wisdom is bitter jealousy. We just saw it. Selfish ambition, division. Look at this. The root is the heart. The fruit of godly wisdom is purity, peace, gentleness, mercy. The root, once again, is the heart. Many times we could say something like this. It's just that I'm so impatient. I'm quick to get angry at people. I'm not as loving, I'm not as gracious, I'm not as patient, I'm not as merciful as I know I should be. And if if I'm driving somewhere and somebody, er, somebody cuts me off, I know that I have to love that person. I know that I have to bless that person. Pastor Javier bought a big old tongue last week. He said, I gotta speak life to that person. And we try to bless that person on the freeway, and we try, but other languages come out. Other tongues come, not the heavenly tongues, other tongues come out. We end up cussing them out. Maybe on the way to go worship Jesus. Maybe that was you. Who cursed me out. I'm just playing. I'm just saying, safe space. Other people would say, man, it's just my kids or my spouse or my coworkers or my family members or other people in church. And they just get on my last nerve. And I know that I know that I have to love them as Christ loved them. And we try. We try to be more loving. We try to be more patient. We try to be more gracious. And nothing works. And we get frustrated. Things don't change. Beloved, you know why things don't change sometimes? Because we try to change our fruit 
without giving Jesus access to our root. When it comes to real life change, not just memorizing and preaching and teaching scripture, but when it comes to real life change, the root comes before the fruit. Why don't you tell your socially distanced neighbor, root before fruit. So James is saying, how we act on the outside is a reflection of what we have on the inside. And as Pastor Javier pointed out last week, his half-brother Jesus in Luke 6.45 says the exact same thing. Out of the abundance of the heart, the root, the mouth speaks, the fruit. Whatever wisdom you and I have on the inside is going to come out because the root produces the fruit. But God, our Heavenly Father, desires us to put his wisdom, godly wisdom, on display. Amen? Now, why do we need this? We need godly wisdom because it gives weight to our witness. Weight to our witness. Look at James 3.13. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. Now, it's interesting because James says that godly wisdom should be visible. It should not just be intellectual. Wisdom is shown through our works. Now, I don't know if you've noticed this, but... We live in this tension as followers of Jesus. This tension between the old and the new. This tension between living how we used to live and living how we ought to live. And this tension creates a gap. It creates this distance between our belief and our behavior. Now let me tell you, this gap exists because as Christians, there is a difference between where we are positionally in Christ and how we live practically in this world. In Christ, positionally, we are children of God. In Christ, positionally, we are clothed with the righteousness of Jesus. We are seated in heavenly places. We are new creations. But there are moments where practically, Lord God, Practically, we wall out and the BC, before Christ version of us, comes out. That's how we could be running and blessing God on Sunday and then cussing somebody out on Monday. And James talks about that earlier in chapter 3. There's a gap. And guess what? We see this in the Bible. Just look at the Christians in Corinth. Look at the reason why we have 1 Corinthians in the Bible. Now, the Corinthian church was messy. Let me just put that out there. The church was messy. I got a question for you. Again, safe space. Raise your hand if you've ever met some messy church people. All right, show of hands. You got the half raise. You got like the half raise. You got a little. Like I know you want to just raise, just put it up, just one of these. Just one of these. Now, in the first service, I said this, that I was going to ask you all the second question. How many of you would consider yourself a messy church person? Thank you, Jesus. Like two, three. I just bless, bless you all for being transparent in Jesus' name. There were fewer hands, though. Right? Because I'm, I'm, mm, mm. Is the, the brother messy over there, sister messy. It's a messy ministry. I'm good. It's none, none of the messy. Now, let me tell you, the Christians in Corinth were messy. There was so much dysfunction in this church, it would make your head spin. There were so many divisions. People were filled with pride. People were suing each other within the church, taking each other to Judge Judy. This dude in the church was sleeping with his stepmother. It's in the book. Beloved, that's messy. We can call the Corinthian church the Jerry Springer church. It's not even 1 Corinthians, it's 1 Springer. Right, that 1 Springer. Now Paul wrote 1 Corinthians to address and and correct the messiness of the church, but I want to point your attention to two verses in particular. It's the first two verses of of the book. And they're found in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Now I want you to listen and look to how Paul addresses these Christians in this messy, divided dysfunctional Jerry Springer church. 1 Corinthians 1, 1 and 2. Paul, called as an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will and Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God at Corinth. Look at the next sentence. 
to those sanctified. Past tense. Now I'm reading out of the ESV. I know we got some King Jamesers here. If you got the King James or the new King James, I want you to check with me if it says sanctified in your version of the Bible. Maybe I, maybe I got a weird verse. Thank you, Sister McKay. We got, we, got, we got sanctified in Christ Jesus. Look at the next phrase. Called as saints. With all those who in every place who call on the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both their Lord and ours. Now Paul is about to go in on this church. He's about to go in on some correction, but he starts off by calling the Christians in Corinth saints. What do you think of when you hear the word saint? Because when I hear saint, I think of somebody who is morally outstanding and pure, without blemish, blameless, without spot or wrinkle. How could Paul call messy church people in Corinthians, in Corinth, saints? It's because in Christ, they were positionally seated in heavenly places. Positionally, they were new creations. Positionally, they belonged to Jesus, clothed with the righteousness of Jesus. But practically, they were living carnal. They were living worldly. They were on their worst behavior. So Paul has to write 1 Corinthians to address the mess. And he says this, Corinthians, you're not living holy practically, but you are holy. You're set apart. You're consecrated for God's service positionally. So it's time to walk this out. It's time to close the gap between your belief and your behavior. And that's why later on Paul says this. He says, cleanse out, get rid of the old leaven, that you may be a new lump. And look at this, as you really are unleavened. Paul says, get the leaven out because you already are unleavened. That doesn't make no sense. Get the leaven out because you already are unleavened, but get the leaven out. Paul's trying to say, get the sin out practically because you already are holy positionally. And sin prevents you from living practically where you already are positionally in Christ. Why do we need the wisdom of God? Because it helps close the gap. It helps close the gap between belief and behavior. And when we close that gap, beloved, we give more legitimacy. We give more weight, more weight to our witness in the world. Revelation 12, 11, what do we always say in the house? We overcome by what? By the blood of the lamb and the word of our what? Of our testimony. Godly wisdom gives weight to our testimony. Now let's, let's look at an example. Let's say one day, Brother Richard and I, we go to a restaurant. And I'm telling my brother all about this magazine over here. Forks over knives, 100 best plant-based recipes. And I'm telling my brother all about the plant-based lifestyle. And I'm like, Brother Richard, they got some spiced sweet potato tacos. All you need is some sweet potatoes, some chopped up red onions, some minced garlic, some beans, some corn, some cumin, some chili peppers, some tortillas. You don't even need the meat. And I'm telling my brother all about the plant-based lifestyle. Now, what is my brother going to think? If I am telling him all about the plant-based lifestyle while I am eating, in Jesus' name, a 12-ounce T-bone steak with a side of ribs, not even a side of rice or a baked potato, just more meat, just meat and with a side of meat, what's my brother going to say? He's going to be like, wow, I'm, I'm impressed by how much knowledge of the plant-based lifestyle you know. You know a lot. You're going in on that steak, but you know a lot about the plant-based. Right? You know a lot. You're sharing the recipes, the ingredients, the benefits of going plant-based. Now, you, you ain't really plant-based, but you know a lot about the plant-based. There's a disconnect. There's a gap between your knowledge of being plant-based and actually eating plant-based. And in the same way, beloved, it's not enough to just preach and teach and sing about the Bible. It's not even enough to activate your spiritual gifts and we got some gifted people in the house. And praise God. Because those gifts, every good gift come from the Father of lights. Amen. It says that in James chapter 1. But it is possible, let me just say this. It is possible to activate your gifts, to exercise your gifts without giving off, giving off any spiritual fruit. 
There is a difference between the fruit of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. We can't put all the energy in the gifts, the gifts, the gifts, and forget about the fruit. We also got to walk this out. Show off Jesus through our words and our actions. Amen? Now, just to clarify, each and every one of us here, we are a work in progress. Nobody's a finished product. Nobody's all polished and ready to go be with Jesus in glory. All of us are a work in progress. And what that means is we're not going to get this thing right all the time. There may even be some seasons where you feel like you're taking one step forward in the things of God and two steps back. Two steps forward in the things of God and one step back. And you feel like you're in a war. And it's because you are actually in a war. But as the people of God, the called out ones, we are called and commanded to fight to close the gap between our belief and our behavior. Or as James says, between being hearers of the word and being doers of the word. And like I said, our war is daily. And it's complex. Because our war is external and it's internal. Externally, we're fighting the world. We're fighting the devil. Internally, we're fighting the flesh. But God has built us to fight. To fight to press and close the gap. Paul says this in Philippians, Philippians 3.12. He says, not that I've already obtained this, not that I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Let me tell you, as messy, as messy, as dysfunctional, as, as difficult, as your walk with Jesus may seem sometimes, press on to close the gap. I want you to tell your neighbor, press forward and close the gap. Why do we need the wisdom of God? Because it gives weight to our witness. It helps us close the gap between our belief and our behavior. Now, how do we walk this out practically? How do we walk this out? Two things we need to do. First off, we need to know. And second, we need to sow. We need to know this, beloved, that everything that you and I need in order to walk in godly wisdom and walk in victory, we already have in our possession. I want you to listen to the words of Peter, 2 Peter 1, 3 and 4. His divine power has granted to us, look at this, all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. This is incredible. There are so many biblical calories in these verses. Peter talks about a divine power and a divine nature. Now, if there's somebody that knows about the divine power of God working inside of us, it is absolutely Peter. The same Peter who denied Jesus three times before he was crucified was the same dude, the same Peter, who boldly proclaimed the name of King Jesus, the King of glory, in front of thousands of people 50 days later at Pentecost. So in 50 days, Peter went from being filled with fear to being filled with fierce boldness. What changed in Peter? That was 50 days. That was less than two months. What changed in Peter? Did he start working out more? Did he get a Peloton bike to get his confidence back? What did Peter have at Pentecost that he didn't have when Jesus was crucified? A better question would be, who did Peter have at Pentecost? And better than that, who had Peter? And the answer is the presence and the dynamite power of God the Holy Spirit. Peter shows us in these verses, beloved, that when we have the Holy Spirit, we have a divine nature. There is a new thing that is happening inside of us. And when the Holy Spirit has us, we have a divine power. Beloved, you and I have access to this divine power. That Pentecost Peter power. I feel like saying, Peter Piper picked the pickled pepper in Jesus' name. You got that Pentecost Peter power. Tell, tell your neighbor, you got that Pentecost Peter power. Me rhyming in this you got like look you got you got that Pentecost Peter power 
you ain't just anybody. You ain't just anybody, beloved. The person sitting to the right and to the left of you, they ain't just anybody. They are a carrier of the power and the presence of the God of the universe. The God who created all things visible and invisible. Now there's a song that we've sang in the, in the house and it says this, Jesus on the inside working on the outside. Oh, those are beautiful lyrics. Those aren't just lyrics. That is a reality in the people of God. You and I have the dynamite power, that, that Pentecost Peter power. Now somebody listening to this is going to be like, what in the world is this chubby dude screaming about so much? Man, how is this even possible? How could a finite human being be a vessel for the infinite, vast, eternal God of the universe? And the answer is through the gospel. Through the finished work of Jesus when he was on the cross. Through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. 2,000 years ago, God put on flesh in Jesus. Heaven came down to earth so that earth could now access heaven. The Lord Jesus, 100% God, 100% man, he came down. He lived the life we should have lived, perfect obedience to the Father. He died the death that we deserved on account of our sinfulness before God. And three days later, he resurrected in power. And then he ascended to the right hand of the Father. And when he ascended to the Father, God the Holy Spirit descended and now does his habitation in the people of God. And that is good news. Not just a visitation of the Spirit, a habitation of... Marcus ain't here because he's the one that I learned that from. I'm trying to give him a shout out. Not just a visitation, but a, but a habitation of the Spirit of God. And listen, this is good news because the Word of God says this. If you repent of your sins... If you have a change of mind, if you repent of your sins and put your faith in Jesus, confess that he's your Lord and Savior, you will be turned into a new creation. The old things have passed away. All things are made new. Your shame and your guilt is removed and you are moved from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his marvelous light. Not only that, but you receive a divine nature when God the Holy Spirit is poured out into your heart now listen we've been saying that there's a difference between root and fruit religion deals with the fruit and what i mean by that is it deals with the externals with the things on the outside jesus and christianity deal with the root christianity says that your root and my root were dead they were lifeless but jesus came who is rich in mercy and grace, he came and put his life into our root system and now we can produce good fruit because the good tree produces good fruit. And practically what that means is that everything you need in order to walk in godly wisdom and victory you already have in your possession. Now I call back to a story that my parents told me of a great aunt in El Salvador. And she was frantically looking for some fancy gold earrings of hers. And she flipped that house upside down. I don't know if you ever lost something and you just flip your house upside down in Jesus' name. We just recently went through a situation where we lost my wife's phone. And we flipped that house upside down. Now my aunt in El Salvador was frantically looking for those earrings. And then she sees her daughter and she says, have you seen my gold earrings? And her daughter looks at her funny and she's like, your gold earrings? And her mom's like, yes. And she's like, ma, you're, you're wearing the gold earrings. And then she had to look in the mirror and she realized that she already had on what she was looking for. Everything that you need in order to walk in godly wisdom and victory, you already have in your possession through the Spirit of God. And the Bible has to remind us of this constantly. Constantly. I'm a father. We got a little girl. I got to constantly tell her the same thing over and over and over again. Right, I don't know if you've ever seen Finding Dory. She's like, I got short-term memory loss. She didn't say memory loss. She says memory loss. 
He's like, hi, I'm Dory. I got short-term memory loss. We like Dory sometimes. We hear the word or we read the word and then we leave the church and it's like, this person just cut me off. I'm about to... We got short-term memory loss in the things of God. We need to know this. And that's why the Bible says Christ in you. Not Christ to the side of you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. He who is in you, he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. He has to constantly reinforce this so that we get this, so that we know this, beloved. But let me tell you, knowing is half the battle. That's what my Bible says. It was G.I. Joe. Some of you don't even know what that is. Knowing is half the battle because the power needs to be released. So how is it released? Number two, we need to sow. Paul says this in Galatians 6, 7, and 8. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that he will reap. The one who sows to his flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. The one who sows to the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. Now, if we desire to think like Jesus and talk like Jesus and walk like Jesus, which is everything James has taught us, wisdom, words, works, we got to abide with Jesus. We got to abide in the vine. We got to stay connected to the life source. I don't think anybody has explained it as good as Pastor Bob Sorge in his book, Secrets of the Secret Place. When he's writing about meditation, he says this. The one who meditates in God's word will slowly transform the inner well, the inner well from which his soul draws. Jesus said a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good. An evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And then Pastor Sorge says this, by meditating in the word, we are depositing, depositing good treasure within our inner being. That is really good. That is really good. All of us have an inner well where we draw from. If we deposit the good things... We're going to draw out good things. If we deposit carnal or worldly treasures, that's what we're going to draw out. So quick question as we start to land the plane here. What are you depositing in your well, beloved? What are you depositing in your well? Because whatever you deposit, that's what you're going to draw out. I could be praying, Father, I want to be healthier. You know, I'm not trying to have problems with this, this bathroom scale. And I could pray every day, every day, every day without ceasing. But I could also be eating Big Macs and hash browns every day without ceasing. So I pray every day, every day, every day. I pray. But I also eat Big Macs and hash browns every day, every day, every day. But I pray. The father, you're going to be like, okay. He's going to be, okay, the, your prayer has reached the throne of grace, son. Because Jesus, your mediator, brought the prayer up. Put the Big Mac down. I mean, you praying, great. Keep praying, keep seeking, keep asking, keep knocking, keep pursuing, but put the Big Mac down. I know the hash browns is gold. And they're crunchy. They look like the manna. They look like the manna from heaven. You're like, that's, that's from the Lord. That's from the Lord. He's like, put it down, though. In the same way, many of us want to be spiritually healthy. And we're waiting on certain breakthroughs. And we're pursuing and seeking the Lord. And we're praying without ceasing. And for some of us, the Lord may be telling us today, put the worldly Big Mac down, though. Put down the Twitter and the Instagram for a little bit. Put down the CNN and the Fox News and the MSNBC. Too much Hulu will not make you holy. Too much Netflix ain't going to help you walk in newness. The Lord's like, how about some more you version and less YouTube? Now, I ain't going to say nothing about no Disney Plus because my wife is looking at me. I'm trying to have a good Sunday after this. I'm trying to have a good Sunday in G. I'm saying no, nothing about no Disney Plus. 
Now, I'm not saying that those things are necessarily bad because my wife and I, we have our shows that we like to watch. And every so often, we like to binge on some of them things. But look, when you get consumed with some of that, it can prevent you from becoming as fruitful as God wants you to be. Some of that stuff ain't even healthy the other way. So what are we depositing into our well? The last question that we could ask ourselves is this. Will this fill in the blank? It could be a social media feed, it could be a news channel, a song, a movie, a friendship, a relationship, a podcast, a conversation. Will this blank help me cultivate worldly wisdom or godly wisdom? Beloved, there are no cheat codes, there are no life hacks for the wisdom of God. It's going to require time and intentionality, so let us focus on the good deposit. In this next season, beloved, let us be intentional, let us focus on the good deposit. The good deposit of community and connection. The good deposit of the prayer perimeter and pathways. The good deposit of life groups and phone check-ins and text check-ins and Zoom check-ins. And getting into that word and creating an atmosphere of worship. That is the good deposit. When we deposit the good stuff into our root, into our heart, we're going to produce some good fruit. James teaches us, beloved, that faith is a faith that works. It works in the wilderness, what we go through. It works through our works, what we do. It works through our words, what we say. And it works through our wisdom, how we think and how we act. The Lord Jesus desires what is best for us, beloved. And what is best for us is to walk in his wisdom, not the wisdom of the world. Our Father withholds no good thing from us. So let us be those that walk in godly wisdom and stay close to King Jesus. Amen? Let's close our eyes. I want to pray for us. And first, I want to pray for those that do not have a personal relationship with Jesus. We're talking about root and fruit. We talk, this is not a religion. It's not a religion of ritual. This is a relationship. And Jesus is inviting us today to enter into a relationship with him. God wants your heart. He didn't just come to conquer an earthly kingdom. He came to conquer your heart. And if you want to make that decision today, this is good news, but good news demands a response. And that response is repentance and faith. Repenting of your sins, putting your faith in Jesus, confessing that he is Lord and Savior. And there is a promise when you repent and believe, beloved. That promise is that you will never be the same again. That promise is that you're going to be a new creation. The old things passed away and all things are made new. If you want to make that decision, I just want to encourage you to repeat after me. And, and after saying this prayer, I also want to encourage you to just stay connected. It's not just a prayer that we say. It's a lifestyle. Stay connected to the house. So if you want to make that decision today, repeat after me. Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. And I confess my sins before you. My sins of thought, of word, and of deeds. I declare that I've fallen short, but that's why I come to you, Father. And I ask that you forgive me of my sins, that you would cleanse my conscience, that you would change me from the inside out, that you would turn me into a new creation through the Spirit of God that is poured into my heart. I give to you my faith, my family, my finances, my future. Have your way in my life. I'm tired of going my way. I want to go your way. And I fix my eyes on you. Make me new today. Jesus, I ask this in your precious name. Amen. Now I want to close this out, beloved, just for the rest of this time. Amen. Amen. He's in the business of making things new and making things whole. So let me pray for us right now. We're going to close this out. Father, I thank you, Lord Jesus, for each and every person that was here today, everybody that's watching in the live stream or will be watching this later. And Father, the, the desire of our heart is that we would draw near to you because your word says that when we draw near to you, you draw near to us, Father. Enable us, empower us through the power of the Holy Spirit to hear the word and to do the word. We don't just want to be hearers. We want to be doers. We want to activate this faith, Father God. Help us to fix our eyes on you, Jesus. Help us to leave this place different, better than when we came. Because the name of Jesus, the name above all names, the King of glory has been exalted. 
I pray a hedge of protection over every person here, every person watching over their family, Lord God. And I pray that the joy of the Lord would be their strength and our strength now and forever. We ask this in Jesus' name. Anybody said? Amen. Amen.